way they have been running McKinsey, they almost seem to be saying that the nine years that Rajat Gupta headed McKinsey were a mistake. Yeah, I'd like you to add to that. You know, Rajat Gupta used to uh, quote a lot from the Bhagavad Gita. He used to uh, tell colleagues, you shouldn't be interested in the fruits of your labor. Uh, you know, it's just work unto itself. Um, but the McKinsey he ran um, operated under very different principles. And one of the things that started happening in the 1990s when he took over is that every year when he sent a, a letter to the partners, he would tout how much their annual award had grown. And this became so distasteful to one of the former managing directors, Ron Daniel, that he actually chided Rajat. He said, you know, I, you know this, is so, this goes so against the grain of what Marvin Bauer stood for. And to get a sense of how, how much of a departure Rajat was from what operated before, um, for the book, I ended up interviewing Jeffrey Skilling, the former CEO of Enron, who's actually sitting in prison. And I wrote to him. And um, Jeff has a lot of time on his hands these days, and he wrote back. And, um, and um, he told me a story about how in the late 80s, uh, there was a committee at McKinsey that looked at the possibility of accepting stock from clients. Uh, this was an initiative that the Wall Street uh, contingent at McKinsey uh, really wanted. And after many, many iterations and many looking at this, the, um, the, they decided that, that it wouldn't work. There were too many conflicts involved. And then fast forward a decade later, and you have the dot-com boom, and, and Rajat is faced with this clamoring from the young McKinseyites about you know, taking stock from clients. And all of the procedures, uh, the committees that had opined on this in the late 80s were disbanded, and instead the, the, the system was put in place. That is just a, one sign of how, how Rajat changed the culture of the place. And ultimately, uh, I think to its detriment. Uh, if I may, uh, I don't know about you, but I am fundamentally suspicious of somebody who quotes the Bhagavad Gita and calls himself a karma yogi. The, I mean, any chance he gets in any interview, whether he is talking to Business World in India or Harvard Business Review in the US. Um, there is a view uh, among a lot of people um, whom I have met socially, also through uh, my alumni circle, uh, that Rajat Gupta was only doing what everyone else was doing, apparently, which is sharing tips with friends, setting up consulting practices to pave the way for his retirement while he was at McKinsey. Apparently, everyone does it, A, in India, B, Perhaps also in uh, you know in in the diaspora elsewhere. Um, I don't know how far this everyone does it go. So I really wanted to ask you your opinion. Is is it just an Indian diaspora thing? Is it an Indians in India thing? Is it everyone in Wall Street and everyone in this business thing? How true is this statement? Or was he um, actually victimized? Or um, you know d does everyone actually do this? You know, I was on a panel in, in Mumbai uh, uh, in, in December, and someone, someone asked the question, well, why, you know, would, you, would you trade if you didn't trade on inside information? I mean, that's the view in India. I mean, you have to have inside information to trade. So I think, I think certainly in India, trading on inside information is quite common. Uh, I think what was extraordinary about the Rajat Gupta case, to be honest with you, is, is who was Rajat Gupta? He was the three-time chairman of McKinsey, which is the gold standard of the consulting business. This is a firm that advises boards on, on how to do the right thing. This was a man who was part of the American establishment. And I would argue, at that level, amongst his peers, not everyone trades on inside information. Sure, you know, there are Americans lower, lev uh, lower down on the food chain who trade on in in inside information. There are members of the Indian diaspora in America who trade on inside information. But you're talking about the high priest of consulting, and that's what's extraordinary about the Rajat Gupta story. 
Well, I uh, totally agree with uh, Anita about the uh, Indian uh, <coughs> uh, stock markets business. If there was no insider trading, there would be no trading in India. I mean, uh, I mean, if you if you talk to any mm, good upright uh, Mumbai stock exchange trader, he he would be aghast at these charges brought against Rajat Gupta or even Rajat Ratnam. I mean, he he would say, mm, uh, "What is this? How else are you supposed to do business?" So, uh, and uh, the other things that have now come out that while Rajat Gupta was a senior partner, former managing director, and senior partner, uh, the sort of uh, eminence grace of McKinsey, he has set up a consultancy business on the side in the names uh, of his wife and Anil Kumar's wife. He also knew that Anil Kumar, who was the director of McKinsey, while Rajat was still employed, he knew this, which is uh, evident from his phone conversations, that that Anil Kumar was in the pay of Raja Ratnam, was supplying him information for cash, was being paid about a million dollars in cash in the name of his domestic help Manju Das, uh, a native of Calcutta, this city, <laughs> in a Swiss bank account. He, kn he knew all this. Uh, I mean, you know, but it is common practice in India to, for executives to set up companies in their wife's names uh, and uh, do it on the side, etc. In fact, uh, what's also interesting is that uh, who Rajat's Indian associates were. Uh, this Benami company that he set up in the name of Anita Gupta and Malvika Kumar, it appears to have only one client. Uh, which is Info USA, set up by uh, another uh, very famous and accomplished IIT and called Vinod Gupta, Vin Gupta, who uh, set up a company in his garage, grew it to half a billion dollars, and was finally thrown out of the company by shareholders because uh, he had 20, he had used company money to buy 28 yachts, uh, the 16 private jets, um, uh, 75 houses, or something like that. <laughs> and uh, then uh, Rajat uh, set up. Uh, uh, Mm, private equity fund called New Silk Root Partners, where his partners were Rajaratnam, who uh, is in jail. Rajaratnam, of course, dropped out before the company was uh, finally it started um, uh, going. His two other partners were Victor Menezes, another IITian, uh, former global vice chairman of Citigroup, who was fined $2.7 million by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, because he knew that Citibank was going to take a huge loss on its Argentinian loans and sold off Citibank stocks the day before it became public and was uh, caught and fined $2.7 million. His third partner was a guy called Parag Saxena, another IITian, also fined $250,000 at one time for insider trading by Security and Exchange Commission. So, I mean, it's amazing how this man with the brain with a brain the size of a planet and, uh, you know, the most respected um, Indian in the corporate world and in possibly the philanthropic world also, moved around with these guys, had business dealings with particularly these Indians who were uh, known offenders. Yes, yeah, so he was, uh, my, my question being, uh, is this specifically a South Asian diaspora in the Wall Street problem or does everyone do it? Are we talking about you know every single ethnicity, irrespective of ethnicity, if you're in the trade, if you're there, you're doing this, perhaps some of you get caught or you don't get caught. I mean, the, the sheer number of people you've mentioned are the people who've just, you know, they've been caught. Um, clearly, plenty of other people are doing it. My, my question was, you know, this everyone is doing a thing, the, the statement, is it a statement um, just talking about South Asians in particular or are we talking about anybody who's in the business is doing it? No, I think I think it's not just South Asians who are doing it. I mean, uh, you know, Preet Bharara's office uh, indicted 75 people in the last uh, uh, two, two years and most of them are uh, Americans. Um, so I think I think it's widespread but I d but again 
you know, I don't think everyone is doing it either. And mm -hmm. I think the reason um, the Rajat Gupta case has caused so much shock and consternation in the United States, particularly amongst the highest levels of uh, the South Asian community, is is because he represented something. He was not just your young Indian trader who came to America to make a quick buck. He was really someone who was so well established in the system. You know, Rajat used to love to wear the, the little uh, American flag that George Bush presented him. And um, he was an American citizen. He was... Um, you know, as, as recounted in my book, you know, a month before he found out he had a problem with, with the U.S. feds, he was actually at the White House dinner, uh, invited by President Obama to celebrate uh, Manmohan Singh. And so here was someone at the highest levels of American society, and I would argue at that level, it doesn't happen. So, uh Basically, the, the reason I asked you this is because I'm coming into uh, the nature of his uh, sentencing. And um, I believe his uh, defense lawyers had asked um, for some sort of an extended parole as punishment, uh, saying, you know, why can't he, a person of his caliber, um, help rebuild a war torn nation or something. I mean, but given the sheer, sheer amount of talent he packs. And I believe uh, what the judge was sa uh, judge said was, you know, this is something, I mean, he does philanthropy anyway. This is something he's anyway doing. This is in no way a punishment. So he, he has to go to prison. I mean, I'd like both of you to comment on that. Is that fair, unfair? Um, what, what, what is your view? I think the sentencing uh, is uh, fair in a in an exemplary way, in the in the sense that uh, the prosecution had asked for <coughs> 11 years or something like that, mm, and uh, mm, judge uh, and the judge he explained uh, very clearly in his sentencing statement why he decided on two years uh, mm, because he said you should judge a man as a whole, uh, not just a part of him. And uh, the extraordinary work that uh, Rajat Gupta had done for the poor, the underprivileged, uh, for people suffering from AIDS, tuberculosis, m malaria, the Gujarat earthquake, etc. All of that should be taken into account. And he said, and uh, he had already, by the end of the trial, he had all, I mean, his reputation was already ruined. Uh, his life had been shattered. So sending him to jail for 11 years was not really necessary. He had been punished enough. But he should go to jail. So two years. However, the maximum penalty applicable to such a crime, $5 million fine, that he, w he, uh, he imposed on Gupta. Because, him, because this man was an extremely rich man, $134 million worth. So the maximum... <coughs> Uh, a fine was imposed, but a minimum prison sentence. I think it was extremely fair. Um, yeah. You know, I don't think the sentence actually conveyed how disgusting and repulsive Judge Rakoff thought the crime was. In court, he said what Rajat Gupta did was the functional equivalent of stabbing Goldman Sachs in the back. And he then went on to say, at the peak of the financial crisis, Rajat Gupta got off a board call where it was agreed that Warren Buffett would invest $5 billion in Goldman Sachs. And a minute later, his first interest was to turn around and tell his friend and short-term trading partner, Raj Rajaratnam, about the news. And I think, in a way, um, the, the two years um, uh, didn't quite uh, reflect the anger that Judge Rakoff felt about the nature of the crime because I, he held, he, and I think rightly so, held Rajat Gupta to a much higher standard because Rajat Gupta, of course, was a board member. He was not like Raj Rajaratnam, whose, whose, whose sole job in life is to, to squeeze the most out of the markets. Rajat Gupta's job in life was to keep corporate confidences. And I think Judge Rakoff believed that he had, you know, woefully fallen short of, 
of the mark in this respect and, and, and deceived uh, Goldman and, and its investors? Um, I, I'm not uh, really educated. Uh, mm, just a completely uh, a piece of complete trivia. Uh, Judge Rekhoff's uh, master's thesis was on Mahatma Gandhi. Yeah, I, I, that's in your book, and quite fascinating, really. In fact, uh, I, in both the books, the main uh, characters have been etched out very beautifully. I mean, there, there's a whole cast of characters, and it, um, it's, they're both phenomenal reads, actually. I, I cannot recommend them enough. Um, I, I'm not the best person to comment on this, but reading uh, both books, I, I got the sense that uh, most of the evidence seemed to be circumstantial. So, um, I mean, I'd like both of you now to kind of comment on whether there was enough and at what point and how did they realize or decide that there was enough to nail a Rajat Gupta or, or you know, just to say, you know, we can, we can basically uh, prosecute him. The heart of the government's case was a call on September 23rd that Rajat Gupta made less than one minute after he hung up from this Goldman Sachs uh, board of directors call. And it was, at this, it was on this board of directors call that Goldman decided to accept $5 billion from Warren Buffett. And there were no wiretaps of what was said between uh, Rajat Gupta and Raj Rajaratnam during this, this call that lasted 30 seconds. But what we do know is on that day, Raj Rajaratnam did not receive a call into his personal line from about 2.30. The only call he received was the call from Rajat Gupta. But we also know, because of testimony, uh, one, was, one person who testified was Karen Eisenberg, who was Raj Rajaratnam's executive assistant. And she testified uh, that she remembers receiving a call coming in uh, around 3.50 that day. Uh, from Rajat Gupta's, uh, she didn't know it was Rajat Gupta's line, but uh, subsequent phone records showed it was from Rajat Gupta's line. Uh, and it was from someone who was on a very important list of callers that Raj Rajaratnam had. And Raj had always told her, if anyone from this list calls, you must find me. And that's what she did. And then she also testified that after this call, which was very brief, Raj summoned in one of his lieutenants, and they spoke for a minute. And after this lieutenant walked out of the office, he shouted to the trading floor, buy Goldman Sachs, buy Goldman Sachs. And within the next few minutes, Galleon Group, which was Raja Ratnam's hedge fund, put in an order to buy $40 million of Goldman Sachs stock. It was so late in the day, he couldn't get his whole order filled. We also had testimony at trial from an Indian named Anand Muniapa. He was a trader on the desk that day, and he essentially collaborated the testimony that Karen Eisenberg provided, where he said that he was sitting on the trading desk around the time of 3.50 on September 23rd, and he remembers uh, his boss, Gary Rosenbach, walking out of Raj's office and saying, buy Goldman Sachs, buy Goldman Sachs. And he also remembers being excoriated because he wasn't able to buy enough stock in such a short period of time. So, yes, there, was, there were no wiretaps as there were in, in, in the case of Raj Rajaratnam, you know, where, where there were actual recordings of conversations of, of uh, informants giving Rajaratnam information. But the circumstantial evidence and the, and the witness testimony was so overwhelming that I think I, I do think it was it it was a slam dunk. It was all circumstantial, but as Anita says, it was overwhelming. Uh, a wiretap a wiretap exists of only one conversation between uh, Rajat Gupta and Raja Ratnam, where uh, mm, you c when you hear it, you can make out several things. One, one is very clear that uh, Rajat Gupta is giving out some information about a discussion that took place in a Goldman Sachs board meeting in St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, about whether Goldman Sachs would, want, uh, would be willing to buy a bank or not, which is about a board meeting a couple of months before this conversation, but it is certainly confidential information. He is not supposed to talk about it, what happened in the board. 
secondly, you also um, uh, figure out, and it's it's quite sad when you hear that conversation. You see, you can make out that Rajaratnam is higher in the power hierarchy uh, of these two people. Rajat Gupta wants something from him. He wants a larger role to play in Rajaratnam's galleon group, and he is too much of a gentleman to push for it. And Rajaratnam is a sly man. He keeps changing the topic of conversation and Rajat keeps trying to come back to it, etc. But what you can make out that uh, it's very sad that what, you know, what does Rajaratnam have other than more money? Everything else Rajat Gupta has in bundles more than Rajaratnam. Fame, respect, you know, um, uh, global recognition, um, uh, free entry um, to the homes of the most Mm, powerful mm, people uh, on the planet. Uh, yeah, the evidence was circumstantial and there were loads of circumstantial evidence that can only point to his guilt. Uh, in, the, in the closing statement, uh, the prosecuting attorney, he ended his statement by saying that either you believe that this happened, that this man did these things, or you have to believe that he's simply the unluckiest man in the world. The jury decided that he was not the unluckiest man in the world. I mean, it's so sad. I mean, he's truly, um, you know, your title, Fallen Angel, he does feel exactly like that.